Good morning and welcome back to the channel. So today is going to be the second last day of the season, right? We have the reset on Tuesday and it just makes sense to kind of recap the season, talk about what my favorite decks were from the season, which ones I thought were the best, and if no changes are made, which ones could be a good starting point for going into next season. So I have five different decks and we're going to be doing a top five video in no specific order. They're just going to be my top five from all the ones and counting. I've had even more than what you see here that we worked with as you know, I've been putting up videos every single day this month, but uh, we'll narrow it down here when it comes to, I'm trying to think of the order I play them in the video. So the first one I had a lot of fun with was my bounty syndicate deck. This deck has a lot of control and that's my favorite way to play. I'm more of a control damage type player opposed to a big boosty type player, but I do enjoy that from time to time as well. With obviously broken cards like King of Beggars and the whole Siggy swing, it's phenomenal. Brute gets crazy value here, Savola gets crazy value here, and of course we just have no shortage of removal. So this deck took me to pro, not a problem, when I decided to give it a shot at the beginning of the season. and. I know a lot of people had success stories in the comments about how this took them to pro as well. So don't sleep on this one here. This will likely see some nerfs with the King of Beggars, but I think that this will still be viable even after a nerf because usually when I see a nerf, it's not like a game-breaking nerf, you know, with exception to maybe Vi. And even the Vi nerf was still kind of playable back in the day. So expect this to be a little bit playable. Maybe you have to substitute one or two cards in the new season. But that'll be one of the ones we're looking at today. And the second one, this one was the longest deck I'd ever made. It's a little bugged here. But uh, with this one here, Masquerade Ball, it feels and plays like a classic Masquerade Ball with way more consistency tools. So we don't have to risk going super tall with cards like Joachim to pull out our gold cards and whatnot. We have Yan Calvian who's going to be doing that for us. And we have Dead Man's Tongue to get out some of the bronzes and clean up the deck a little bit. And of course the Blightmaker combos. So we're pulling into very good and very strong cards for our second round. Which makes the world of a difference. Don't sleep on this one at all. Even if Ball gets heat waved, you're fine. Because we have so many points, so much control, so many things to do with our other plays. That it more than often doesn't matter. I went 11-3 and three in my initial review for this. I just read one of your comments on my YouTube video right before recording this right here. Uh, someone else went 11 and 1 with the deck. So this is going to be something that I think will be good going into the next patch. I don't think it's going to see anything here. I don't think Calvi it's going to see a nerf. Everything else has already been nerfed a lot, right? Brathens recently got nerfed. Masquerade Ball got pushed up to 15 provisions uh, shortly before people stopped playing it, but everything else has already been dealt with. Blightmakers have been nerfed over the last couple months, so this deck should just be good to go. So expect a game from that today. We have Battle Trance. I play this for the first time sometime this season. Went on a crazy tear of wins, and after, I think, going undefeated for the deck guide, I decided to go and just do a Let's Play video. So I played for another two hours there, and I think we only lost one or two games in like a two-hour session. So I was feeling pretty good about that too. Um, I like my version because it has the Stribog, and often we're rolling into the second Alchemy card, so it makes a big difference. Lots of visual bugs today. Yeah, you're going to have to pull up the list. I'm going to be putting the links for every deck that's going to be in this video in the description, so you guys can go to those respective deck guide videos and just pull the link for the deck from there. So, again, this one's going to be massive amount of points, and you can see in today's video when I play a game for this that, you know, it's going to be just spitting out points. So if you're playing... If you love playing big boosty decks, this one's for you. It does have some control tools because I don't like to go without them. So look forward to this one here. And I forget how many we counted. I think we counted four. I think we counted four. Fingers crossed. No, we, we, we didn't count four. We counted three. Yaga. Okay. I think this is it. Yeah, so Yaga was one of my favorite ones, my most watched deck guide on YouTube of all time. We hit over 10k views on this one here, so you guys must have liked it as well, and that's really exciting for me. A uh, bunch of visual bugs here, but the whole thing is we're playing around Relics, and we're playing around Thrive, and uh, we have really big point swings with cards like Mamuna and with Bloody Mistress. Really good control tools with what is supposed to be Karathi here, and then the Yaga 
Of course, Toad Prince is an awesome card and, you know, just some good old fashioned damage in the bronze end. So it makes a big difference here. We have the ability to get around a defender or purify one of our cards if we have a bounty or poison on one of our units. So it makes a big difference here. I think you can really push your opponent with the element to surprise from this deck. And I think that this will get you to pro rank with good amount of ease. I don't know how far it'll take you in pro rank because I wasn't really keen on climbing monsters this season. But uh, when I was playing, I was having fun. I was winning games and it was great. So definitely recommend trying that one out. That one's going to be in the video today. And the last one is my newer version of Shield Wall. And I made some edits after the first version of the deck that I had, my first version had a Dahlia instead of Quen. It had um, a couple different, I think it had the second duel with the Selkirk. But uh, my buddy Prodigy was like, man, you got to throw in a Vandergrift. I threw in a Vandergrift and I don't regret it. There's no looking back at it because with the Siri, Siri Dash play and with Vandergrift, we're getting basically the card advantage and we're getting the resilience. So it's just tons of points round one can be taken from cards like wind home immortals and damn sorceress right and we just have huge plays at the end of round three with the whole king rogner the radovid play the sh the duels and all that sort of stuff so this is a lot of fun it spits out points it has a good amount of control something i i jacked it up here with is the trial of grasses as well plays really nice into quen but we can also use it offensively so one of those cards that really makes a difference here and just so we're on the same page, all the games that you're going to be seeing today are not from previous deck guides. These games are recorded for the sole purpose of this video, and the games have commentary. So if you've seen the previous deck guides, you still have some incentive to watch this video because I'm not going to go and recycle games. I'm going to always give you guys something brand new every time you come to my channel. So let's get into the games for today. And thank you guys again for 3k subs. We just hit a crazy goal for the channel. All right, we'll start things off with Syndicate here. This one's going to be my bounty deck. And honestly, this, I believe, could take you 2,500, 2,600 MMR. I don't really grind the ladder, so I think we were just shy of 25 with this one. However, if I was playing more competitively instead of just making different types of decks every single day, I probably would have just ran this one straight through. It was a lot of fun. A lot of gold cards for round one here. Could probably chuck back like the Witchfinder or the Professor. But uh, it's hard to say. In a mirror match, I feel like they're going to really push us here. Which is the problem. We kind of want to have some gold cards in case we get overtaken or we, uh, we lose on even. We have to go into round two. I'm just going to play this the way that I would normally play it, assuming we were playing a different matchup, and not let them really push me to play certain things. So they're playing Cleaver here. That can get out of hand pretty quick. We'll put the engines down, we'll get some spenders down, try to get the boat out soon, and then we'll just see where it is here. Realistically, we could probably just try and get out at 5. I think we rather them payday that anyways. I kind of want to keep the tax collector online. It'll start boosting like a peach anyways in a turn or two, right? Just put down the executioner, get the boat out this turn, start boosting up the tax collector. That's fine. And then I would probably just argue taking our thin. I don't really have a spender. That would have been nice if I had something like a jackal, but I don't really know how I feel about putting bleeding in this case. Especially when half the units they have have shields on them, right? I 
bodies are drowning in shite first, and heads in the clouds. I'm keeping an eye out to see if they have some new patch notes that are going to be coming out over the next day or so. If there is something, I'll be working to get a video up as soon as possible so we could talk about it before the new patch. I'm sure there's going to be something probably on Monday because the new season will be on the Tuesday, right? Yeah, so I don't think we can come back and take this round, which is fine. If you guys are in this situation here, just make sure you pass with five cards, not four. Just go ahead and take the pass here. The thing is, if they bleed, I have a really good hand. So it's going to be hard for them to get like a card advantage. Oh, and the cob put cob back. That's fine. We have a spender being the jackal. I think that's okay. It's probably safer to go damage though instead of boost, but. That's actually pretty good here. Now, here's the problem. Obviously, we can't just go and play a Peach. I want to play a Peach here, but we have to sort of respect the 8 points. We need to get 8 points. So, I think, for what it's worth, I Siggy Boat here. It sort of sets the pace for the round. I just feel kind of guilty using like a professor, let's say, on a bouncer when there might be something more important to take out later. That's probably where you take the peach. And I understand that they're going to be trying to trade as much as possible. So I'm just looking to maybe try and get some bronzes or bounties cycled here and uh, find the right time to put down the freak show. But that might change. It depends on what they play, right? No one can stop the Salamandra. No one. <laughs> it's funny because. Syndicate shouldn't bleed Syndicate with Cobb, because Syndicate has Cobb, right? I just don't see how it really gives them an advantage. We don't even have to spend here. And there's an argument to take maybe a boost or two on the King of Beggars, but for what it's worth, I just kind of wanted to leave it there. I don't think we need to spend anything just yet. We have other means of spending, right? Kind of annoying. So they're committing full leader. We have we still have leader and full bank, so it's pretty good for us here. That's actually a pretty good professor. Just because if they have a couple profit cards, they're gonna have to go tall on the King of Beggars, and they don't know what we have here, right? They know we're playing some bounty, so they might think we have a great in. Heat wave, okay. The 
the heat wave doesn't really get them ahead too well. Um, we can go ahead and just take this here. The reason why I'm hitting down the Savola is because I'm actually thinking about giving it bounty. And we don't have to finish it here just because there's not really a point. We can just play that next turn. So by them boosting it, it puts it in a little bit of an awkward position here. We'd have to use leader to get the coin, but I think we might have to regardless unless we go onto the bouncer in the back. And I didn't have to spend the second time, but... I don't think it's going to cost us the game at all. We're in like a really good spot here. We can just go ahead and put down the Kurt, right? So it's kind of annoying because uh Evil is a word that have been If I would have committed to just sticking the damage into the Savola, even after it was boosted first before the King of Beggars, then we would have had a better cycle of the bounty, right? We would have been able to just finish the kill, opposed to having to go into using the leader there. I don't think it's going to matter. I think that the majority of their points are out of the way, so we just have to top deck a bit better. But there's a lot of things that they would have spent here. We still have Brute and Bank. Now I see that we have access to both. I think uh, Collector is a little bit slow. That's like a little bit better. We have a spender, which is nice. So, probably just start with that. Make her down first, because we want to keep the spender alive, so we want to play that probably second. And we should just be fine. Boat comes out here, puts us at 8 points. If the spender stays, that's great. If the spender doesn't stay, I wonder if we ever just pull Jackal. I think Brute's probably more points anyways. Yeah, Brute's a ton of points. So we'll spend down because we can. Just in case, and we top deck it, that's amazing. And then we can just go ahead here and spend everything else. Sort of playing around a Tavern Brawl right there, playing into Crimes, they have line pockets, so we don't really have a good Tavern Brawl option for them. Like, sure enough, XCOM's not gonna do it here. Last say drill. It's kind of a cool idea. Moving on to the second game, I had a lot of fun with this deck. I posted a deck guide on this one, I posted... A let's play video of just two hours of ladder, ladder climb with the deck. It's honestly really, really strong and uh, pretty easy concept to understand. If you're new to Skellige, if you like playing a lot of boost decks, this one's definitely for you. If 
playing up against Metapod here. To be fair, I think that this is the strongest Skelliga deck right now. Like, I firmly believe that. Um, I think it contends with Onslaught quite well. And I took this up to maybe somewhere around 2475. This game's on peak, but um, I haven't played Skelligus since I did my Let's Play video. So it was one of those things where I just sort of cycle between factions every day for the videos that I make, and then I don't play outside of making videos. So if you wanted to, I think that you can really jam a deck like this and... Uh, climb quite well and if there are any sort of patch updates or changes I don't think that this is going to be affected by it because Fukusha was recently nerfed right so that should just be fine I don't think they're going to touch Mushy Truffle because it does have a condition that makes it so it's not too busted or anything like that uh, we take a temple pass on them here because for whatever reason they're they're giving bounty to something twice kind of like a poison or something like Maybe, I, I, I'm not sure. But uh, with that, I felt like it was too slow of a play. So we could probably just get away with that here. And seeing Siggy on a pass is good news. Orson as well, huge. And they have to go for another turn for sure. I think that was successful because what I was looking for was a long round three. So we have that. Jeez, I'm trying not to sneeze. <clears throat> so we're probably going to get a pass here and then we can look at getting some carryover. There's a couple things to consider. We want to have maybe Crow Mother in Grave going into round three. So it'll just come out naturally when, when we play like a alchemy card. And Mushy Truffle, another thing that we could probably get some carryover with. So I'm thinking about playing both of those, even though it's a dry pass, because it just makes some sense here. And that's like the perfect hand. Realistically, like, Morkvarg and Fukusha are great. We could probably pull into at least one of them, but those are like the go-tos here. I think that's fine. We get back four points next round instead of eight, but we don't have to waste a card or turn playing the eight points. So that's the justification for it. And the same thing with Truffle. We'll take one of these because now we have an option to bring it back. If we have like the Fakusha into it or uh, Stribog into a Freya's into that, you know what I mean? There's definitely different ways to go about it. Teller is okay for a purifying a bounty or something, but I don't think it's super important here. I say that, but we probably need it as soon as we mulligan it back. That looks like a winning hand to me. Reset location twice. Fukusha, we have potential of getting about four Crow Clan Preachers collective with scenario.
I don't see a reason not to just jam it here. I wanted so badly to, to take like the leader here, but it's not worth it. You want to at least get two of them down and get the bonded first before you start playing alchemy cards. And this is where the fun starts, right? Um, I think we gotta... Yeah, we'll stack... We'll just stack range row. And just put the crows on the melee row. Kind of just organizing it for myself, to be fair. Also, put the crows on the melee row, those on the back row, because there's gonna be more crows spawning than, than crow clans. And so we have room to reset the location twice. Because you got to play the Dwims on range row here. And let's just greet it out. Get some nice long six turns of rain. And then just keep that nice and tall. But we have Morkvarg, okay? That's going to be a perfect one, if not a heat wave, right? Depending on where we go from here. And I think we just take that so they all get boosted. Look at this. It's wild. Now, half of them will probably get killed, right? But uh, I think if two of them stick, at least we should win the game in this case. So we have the rain, we can play something like this first, just so that we can get more procs later. And if I use Bride of the Sea to go back and pull off Streebog, I'm going to be looking for obviously two alchemy cards, right? I want to get as many procs as I can for the Crow Clan Preacher, so that's basically one of the big reasons why it's there. I mean, <laughs> guess that was bound to happen, right? Only if I jammed leader. I wasn't playing around Philippa, to be fair. So we have the two turns of rain, so we have to consider playing the, the Sturbog here, otherwise we might lose our chance, right? It pushes us to play it next turn, maybe we wouldn't want to play it next turn, so we take the alchemy, of course. And we're running low on board space, but we just need two more cards, and they're not going to be playing stuff on our side, so it works fine. If anything, they're going to be removing our cards. Two tall removals left, and just a ton of points. So I'm looking at this like, okay, they have Graydon or they have Morils. So we heat wave the Savola because they can spend. If I heat wave like the the beggars, for example, they would just go and spend the coin with their uh, their other spender. So we have to heat wave the Savola, even though the beggar might be taller at the end of the game, and then we can just Morkvarg the Saul after this turn. I think that's the best bet.
Yeah, so I expected something like that. That's fine. So even if they go in the heat wave something, I think we're still fine, right? There is consideration to use offensive Marjoram, but it doesn't make sense on the last turn because they're going to be spending their coin in the last turn, so Saul's not going to work. And 103 to 47, we're fine. And moving on to the next game, we have my Nilfgaard Masquerade Ball deck that I put out a couple days ago. Went for the world record length of longest Gwent deck guide on YouTube, and it was 2 hours and 15 minutes long. There was 12 games there of gameplay, so if you want to see a bit more proof of concept with this deck, I'll make sure I put the link in the description to the previous deck guide where you can find the list and the gameplay. But uh, so far this deck has been great for me. The initial run that I had, I went 11-3. and three. This will be the next game following that, so pretty confident with it. We're playing into Shield Wall first, which is going to be one of the tougher matchups, I would say. We don't really have the round one I'd like to have against them, but... It'd be nice to have two Blight th uh, Maker packages instead of just the one. It's tough because I want to lock everything, but we only have access to two locks. It, that, that's the problem because I play a lot of uh, a lot of this for myself, and you'll see that um, you know Shield Wall is great. It's my favorite Northern Realms deck right now. But you have to lock the Windhelm, you have to lock the Immortals, you got to lock Siri, you've got to lock tons of stuff. The Keldar, and we have access to. The two locks in our bronze end and the two from our leader, so already half of which are gone. So if I was to replay this game... There's consideration to pass at seven which would have given us a chance to get out of the round and uh i'm thinking that maybe they might concede a little bit early because they don't have shields but sure enough they go ahead and they push here which was kind of annoying because a lot of the cards that we have aren't really going to do a whole lot for us like i'm really looking for them to play something that will benefit from hitting with a shield um such as like a one of the witchers right I think the most points over time is going to be coming from the mage, the student. And they're really getting to breaking off the shields pretty quick before we have a chance. I'm looking to get some value from the sorceress that we have, right? Because we could take their shields off as well. They were just right on the ball with it here. So, a couple things. I normally will pass here and just accept the defeat in round one and try to defend the bleed. But the thing is, my hand is so bad that I'm thinking, okay, we might actually have to play this one down all the way. Because one of two things can happen. We can get an overcommitment from them, which ultimately gives us some sort of advantage later on. Or two, we can go two cards down intentionally, because we know with Calviate we're going to be top decking into all our golds, and then we can basically just have better cards than them for round three. So I'm considering taking the latter of the two at this point.
which is why I opt to take care of the blight maker. Normally, I would just play it, but what I'm I just want to get rid of it so that we have more of a chance of Calvia coming up, and I don't really want to have to rely on playing something like that later. So, yeah, we could take that here. That's like the last chance of basically trying to get out. If I was them, I wouldn't pass, though. It doesn't make sense. But the nice thing about it here is if we're looking to go down two cards intentionally, we have everything, like all the means to do so because they'll probably play more than what one of my cards can do and then we have to play both but they don't know what my last card is so they they might just pass saying you know what i have double last say anyways siri can make it like a, a triple last say it should be fine i'm hoping that that's the mindset here seven points we don't have like a clean death blow with the infiltrator which is kind of annoying I don't really want to pull a card. I think we could just play the boat. We've already clicked patience. And so normally, when you're in that position, you'll probably pass too. It just makes sense. So we get the pass we're looking for here. And I'm not feeling too bad about it. I don't think we try and push round two. I think we just have to accept it. Go one card down into round three and just make the most of it. But we did get out some pretty good thins. So we should be pulling into pretty good cards for round three. Not so much here though. We did miss a lot here. Calvi, it's okay, I guess, to proc the ball. It's still pretty good points. The Purify is nice if we want to get around a defender, for example. I think we might have to dump Ven Morlehem Hunter for something stronger. And I think we want, want to have to dump Ku here. That should just be fine. We get Ball. Obviously, we miss Brathens, Ku, and Vincent, which is horrible. But I think that we have a chance, given that we have Ball. We've got a removal off of that. And we have the Yen for a second removal. So, it makes a pretty big difference here. And we'll just jam Scenario. I don't think we ever try and take out Defender. I think we just purify it. Because they're going to be going taller than 7. The Kree instead of Quen. So the shields do help our slides, which is pretty nice. Now, I'm trying to decide if I want to poison out the Siri or if I want to lock it. Normally, these decks don't have the provisions to go ahead and add a Purify. Unless they're doing a Peller. But it's hard to say if they'd want to hold onto the Peller going into round 3. So we could potentially just lock the Siri.
So it's not a bad idea to go ahead and put something down like the Usurper. I'm taking the lock now because if they purify it next turn, I have a turn to react to it. I just don't want any surprises. The easiest for me to manage. Also, it gives me the flexibility of putting down Anna on this turn. I don't know how comfortable I feel about using the leader if they're going to be rocking a Rogner. So, I might not take. Depends on where we are. If we have to, I will. If we don't have to, I won't. Oh, that's fine. Take the poison here. We've got a pretty considerable lead, don't we? So Rogner probably has the three shields and they'll duel out. Okay, that's not great for us, but so with a nine point removal, they have the two shields puts them yeah, we should just be fine, even without playing the leader here. It was a messy round one for sure. We we didn't really top deck too well, but it's fine. We pulled kind of what we needed towards the end. This is my version of Shield Wall. I made two different versions this month. And this would be the newer of the two. I posted the video sometime within the last week if you haven't seen it. And uh, I really like this one because it has Vandergrift and Siri, So it's like a double coin abuse and it's just got tons of points with the engines. It runs really smoothly too with the addition of Quen, John, and Amphibious, right? The deck is cycling pretty well. Everything's in here for a purpose. So I'm enjoying it. Now, I'm just going to jam it. I think that we have to. If it doesn't stay, then so be it. At least the first push that they give it won't affect it. It'll be very awkward for them to use like a Milva or something. And making a bomb and all that. Because I have space and time now, I think it's safe to take a defender because in order to get to Siri now they have to move the defender. And then if they push Siri back, well it's behind the defender again, right? Yeah, so they were just counting on it with the heat wave, so that's perfect for us. Now, I kind of want to play around making a bomb, so there's consideration to put something on the range row. Also want to play around a serpent trap, but they do have a heat wave, so I'm starting to think maybe they don't have one. I think that should just be fine. And then we have another turn to play something beside the wind home to make it maybe not as good of the odds that the cat witcher is going to be hitting. It's a late Saskia. 
And we successfully flipped the coin here, so that's good. I think we put Immortals down 50-50 that it breaks the shield and boosts it when it goes back to range another 50-50. Saskia is really great. Like, it's very strong, brings up tons of engines, but they gotta put up with our points per turn as well, and ours are pretty crazy too. Kind of a busted combo, for what it's worth. Consideration to take a duel here. Consideration to take the uh, the grasses. I opt for the the card because I'm I don't know if it's traps necessarily. They might have some traps, and if they play like a unitless round, it could be kind of annoying to maybe put down a duel. Whereas I can use the grasses defensively, right? So I don't think I want to Keldar in round one. We'll start getting this engine going. I think that's fair. And we have to respect all the points they're getting every turn. What are the odds, right? Might as well take that. The other option is to put the Centurion down, but I think that it's probably more points over the next three turns. Because if you think about it, Catwitcher goes back to the range row, and then it gets boosted by the Matron, and then the Sentry is going to be boosting them both. So, to turn that and flip, cut it in half, it's going to make a pretty big difference here. And there was a debate to put that on the melee row and then use it, but I felt like there was a chance that they would ping the shield anyways. Okay, round went on even. We have one good card into a bleed. We'll see what else we can pull into, right? But I think we have to go for it a little bit here, just push. So with John Amphibious is confirmed. We have some resilience, which is great. They're not, probably not expecting it. Most decks, if not all of the decks that I'm seeing right now. I haven't seen anybody else running Vandergrift. I think it's a lot of fun too, though. That's a pretty good hand, even though we don't have a lot of the stuff that we need here. So Kaldar with Adrenaline. Let's just pump it out here. And I think they should respect it, right? Like, if I was them, I'd be removing this. You are no lunatic of mine. For you! 
I'm so glad that we didn't put down resilience first, otherwise we would have been in trouble. They had to purify there. There we go, they get rid of it, and that too. So we got the leader out of the way. At this point, I'm not expecting the 2-0. I'm just expecting to play cards, basically. So we get the six point carryover so far, they get a six point carryover. Could probably just take the envoy here. Just because we can at least have a look at what's in the deck, put something maybe of value to the top so we could, you know, have a little bit better of a round three. It's kind of annoying. Now, two things. I should have passed here, I think. I think that would have been fine. But uh, considering that we had a little bit of a lead, I actually wanted to see if we had the opportunity to just get them to click the location as well. They didn't need to click it, though. So they would have been up, but I guess they panicked and clicked it. If we would have passed, they had to play Gord, they would have had to carry over. If we played there, obviously we would have got the Gord, but maybe they shouldn't have spent the location. So, bit of greed for us, a bit of a mistake for them. I think we should still be okay here, though. But next time I'd probably pass, to be fair. I think we want to go ahead and put a shield on the bleeding so that it doesn't take the damage this turn. So, realistically, the most amount of points is probably... It's probably not the Ragnar, actually. It's probably the, uh... One of the lower provision cards, but I'm just playing this for the, the video. So we won by four in this case. We would have won by a few more points the other way. Uh, I think, it, I think it was actually still fine, even if they didn't click location. And the last of my favorite decks of the month for patch 9.6, we have my Monsters Yaga deck. And I'm not even joking, this deck was actually a lot of fun to play. I think it's very strong still. I think it competes with a lot of decks in pro rank. Even though Yaga's conditional, realistically, if you get a good Yaga, you're good to go. And people got to respect the Yaga. Now, you can always swap it out for something if you don't feel comfortable playing it. In that provision, you could put in like the spear tips up there. You could put in she who knows. It's in that range. We're not devotion here, so you can put in honestly like a Yurden or something if you want to, like Igni, whatever you know. Any sort of removal, maybe whether it be like a Geralt of Rivia. Because we have a Thrive thing we're working with, we also just have a Control thing we're working with. So you can use your imagination, like, it shouldn't change the deck too much. I'm going to go ahead here and take the Purify on the Yoakim, just because I feel like, okay, at least we can avoid a coup for them. Them, Yo taking Yoakim into Roach is massive. 
you should really play another gold card before you take it because the roach will come out when you play a gold card And this was my most viewed video on YouTube of all time. The one that I had with the Yaga. So I'm doing my best effort in this game to get you guys a good Yaga here. Kind of scary it's like now it's nudged down i'm thinking okay they might be going in for a coup we need to turn to set up shop here but we can go ahead and take our thin after we got space and mushy truffle i mean we we have like the push to go pretty well all in here i don't mind spending anything we have and they're clogging us so i'm thinking okay maybe it's colgrim of some sort right i thin colgrim I'm looking at our odds of pulling into the Aga, and I'm feeling pretty lucky today. So here we go, guys. So there's some consideration to put that in there beside the... The um, other relic, but I kind of wanted to play around like a treason or something like that. Ender Rose should be fine. We still have the bonded effect that we could put on the ranged roll with the lesser witchers to get the um, Gansian proc on both sides. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, we can play a little bit slower here and see if they give us the pass. But there's also consideration just to jam location. If I didn't have Pig still going on that turn, I probably would have played Location first, but I think we should just be fine. And they're thinning just right down, it's nuts. Eight cards in deck. Colgrim, like, that's why I'm expecting Colgrim. There's such a big difference in cards in the first round alone. That sucks. That sucks. 10 points off Lesser, 6 points off Location keeps us ahead. And last say, I think our last say is better than their last say. Yeah. So we're good. I think we just go for it. Now, they moved the Peller into my deck. So if they're running... That's a pretty good hand. That's a pretty good hand. Um, so, one of two things here. We could pass, go for long round, take Heat Wave potentially, or we could just try and get out like a Colgrim in round two. Or if they don't have it, and then maybe it's not a Colgrim deck, we can just, you know, try and outpoint them here. We have a lot of really tall units in hand, so... And like I mentioned, I'm going to be looking for the patch notes to make some kind of video for that. And then you know that when the new season starts, I'm going to be putting in some extra hours, making sure that I understand what's going on to give you guys the scoop so you guys can play competitively, get back to pro rank, whatever the case may be, as soon as possible. So that'll be it. And um, the reason why I play the Gansey in here before the Bloody Mistress is just because I haven't decided at this point if I'm fully convinced at going all in here. Um, let's take that. Not fully convinced, you know what I mean? So I, I keep Peller just in case I need it for the Defender later. So Vilgefurz pulls out Gantt. So even if they do have a Colgrim here, it's not enough to win the game, right?
but that's why we play Peller there. I think it's just a 2-0. We'll see you guys tomorrow with a brand new video. And thank you for 3,000 subs.